This is JCTTV. This is Bible Study for the 21st Century. Today is my second interview with Dave Toyson. Dave is the former president of World Vision Canada. He is an American who worked with World Vision in the States for many years, then he went to Australia. And then for 30 years, he was the president of the Canadian operation. World Vision is highly regarded around the world, as you know. His experiences are just amazing. And we're gonna talk about him, about World Vision, and about some of the situations he's been in. And it's absolutely fascinating, don't miss it. JCT TV is the official voice of WOW, working for orphans and widows. Jim Cantillon is the founder of WOW and has been ministering to orphans and widows in distress for 18 years. WOW's focus is home-based care for the dying. The horizon is vast, with thousands of the least of these in Africa and India. WOW depends on your generous support. To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. You met Dave Toyson last program, and if you missed last program, you can you can watch it. Just log on to jimcanlontoday.com or uh, my YouTube channel, and you can watch the interview with Dave Toyson last time. He is the former president of World Vision Canada. He's an American from Wisconsin. Uh, he worked both in the U.S. and in Australia before uh, taking on leadership responsibilities in <laughs> Canada. But he is a man who for 43 years has really had his finger on the pulse of some of the, uh, the distressed people in our world. In fact, I don't know if you have it statistically, David, but uh, would I be off base if I were to say that the majority of people living on this planet are living in one degree or another level of poverty? I think, yes, I think if you have a broader definition, yeah, but, depends but, on, obviously, extreme poverty, the good news yeah. around that, that's declining. Yeah, that is declining. That has declined, yes. But I know there are billions who are living on less than $2 a day, so. That's right. I mean, Still, it boggles the mind for us here yeah. in North America. Um, you've been everywhere, and, uh, you know, I've followed your career. I, I've, I've seen videos of you in every kind of potential situation. Uh, World Vision is very involved in not just development, but also in uh, disaster relief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about disaster relief for a bit. You've been in some of our world's greatest historic disasters. When you think about disasters you have experienced and you have been on the scene and you've been with the people, what would be the one that jumps out as maybe the most impactful in your life? It's it's a really hard question to answer because I I've been in enough really difficult ones that they they've all had an impact on my life. Sure. Um, I suppose the probably the most recent one would be the the Haiti earthquake mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in what 2010. Right. That was that was a really nasty one and and Haiti struggles in so many ways already. And then to get that dumped on top of all the challenges that people face there is really difficult. And then I would say another one much earlier in my career 
would have been, say, the uh, Khmer Rouge, uh, mm -hmm. you know, revolution that went on in Cambodia. Okay, let, 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 let's 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 focus on those two. Let me ask you a few questions about Haiti and then about Cambodia. What what did you discover when you landed in Haiti right after that earthquake? Well, it, there, it was just widespread devastation uh, in just so many places, and you know, buildings down and then buildings that you didn't know there'd be another rattle later that could fall down. Mm. Uh, most of the public services were gone um, and people had you know, nowhere to stay. Uh, the, the whole economic side of the country was paralyzed. Uh, although people, they're resourceful, they you know, started you know, working difficultly or quickly, but uh, it, it was just, and the infrastructure uh, and then the numbers of people who were killed. Hadn't there been a major uh, hurricane just a, a year yeah, or so before yeah, this? That's and they right. were still recovering from that's that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, you, you wonder, I mean, how many times can a nation have its back broken before it just gives up? But, yeah. but as you say, there's resilience there and they didn't give up. No, no. I mean, and that's one of the things I think about doing humanitarian disaster work, as, as terrible as it is, as tragic as it is. And, and those are the times in my own experience where my faith was tested the most because you're, you're just seeing you know, why do people suffer? People that are really quite innocent, why do they suffer? But at the same time, I'm always reminded they don't give up. Mm. Now, there's, I'm sure there's specific examples where people, if they have a particular emotional problem or whatever, there'd be cases of people who've given up. But by and large, these people do not give up, partly because they know if they don't get back doing something, there isn't anybody else that's going to help them. And so uh, that was also in a, in a, it seems to kind of strange in a way perhaps, but I, that always challenged me and said, you know, you're all hung up with your Western education about questioning why God would allow this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're not illegitimate questions, yeah. but these people are saying, we don't have time for that. Yeah. We just, we want to find some bread that we can feed our children today. And that, al that always motivated me when I, even when I saw the terrible things, I said, how can we, how can we, those of us privileged living where we come from, how can we uh, get all tied up in this when the local people are setting the example for us? Uh, this is a question I wanted to ask. Uh, just give me a little bit of orientation right now. Pretend I'm one of your uh, staffers who's just first timers. <laughs> okay, we've just arrived in Haiti. The place has been absolutely devastated. Buildings are falling over. People are living on the streets. Uh, there, there's hunger, uh, disease, lack of water, all of those horrible things. What's the plan? What, what, what does World Vision do? How, what's, what's, what's number one? What's number two? What's number three? In general, what is the process? Well, uh, in, in, today we've got much more staff and infrastructure who are ready to go. So you've got a, a first emergency team. Now, in some cases too, like Haiti, we had an office there. So we mm. had people there mm. and they, there were plans in place if a disaster happened. Mm. So that's one situation. But then there are other places where you don't have. So you've got to basically set up. They have to find a place to, that they can pitch a tent or find somewhere to sleep. And then they put together with the modern communications today, you're, you're setting up uh, your ability to communicate. Uh, we might even have a technical person who's good at that if we have to do that. And so you, you basically set up a little office and then you start asking, where's the worst need? Who's doing what? Coordinating with the other agencies just to make sure you're not... You're not competing with each other, but you're working together. You're going to talk to whatever, whatever government facilities there. That what what are they providing with this? We want as much as possible be doing something that, if the government's functioning, that we're working somehow with the government because in the end they're the ones who are going to have to make this sustainable going forward. Well, it seems to me there's a massive communication. Oh uh, yeah, and then you're trying to communicate all around yeah, the I mean, world. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean. Uh, well, f even even in terms of c trying to get all the agencies on the same page, I mean, okay, so you're doing that, we won't do that, we'll do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're doing that, okay, we'll do this. I mean, uh, the coordination, and then on top of that, the government, I mean, you must have a few people whose full-time job is just kind of saying, okay, here's what this group's doing, here's what that, is, am I, Well, I'm you've got to track it. And then yeah. and then you also realize the UN is there as well. And right. they're, they're the, uh, normally the overall coordinator, depending on the capacity of the go local government. So, I mean, there's a... There's a structure to this, yeah. but it's still chaotic in those first, you know, the first 24 hours yeah. because you oftentimes people are caught by surprise. And even though they've got plans in place, whether it's a, you know, a natural disaster or whether it's war, you know, suddenly a place is overrun. 
What about war? Have you been in situations where there has been either a former war or a war that's encroaching or a war that's right. ongoing? Uh, and, and if so, how do you deal with that factor? Well, you, 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 you're going to take risks, but we try to respect the fact that our staff, you know, that, that we're human beings and we have a responsibility to our families to not take stupid risks. Mm. But sometimes that happens. Mm. Um, and so you're, you're, you're trying to be responsive and, and at the same time trying to be as, as smart as you can about safety for your staff and also for the people you're serving. Were you in a situation where your personal safety was at risk? Well, a couple of times I was near shooting, that sort mm. of thing. I think that for me, I think the most risky situations in some cases were going into countries where there was civil war. Mm. So for example, like Sierra Leone, mm in West Africa, and you've got 12 and 13 year old kids with AK-47s, mm. they're smoking dope, mm. and they may be on pills, mm. and you're going through there. Yeah. And because children, in many cases, they don't understand, they just don't understand death in the same way as an adult does. Yeah. And so it's, those to me are the most challenging situations. You know, over the last few years, Dave, as you know, there's been a, a real spate of kidnappings of, uh, uh, foreigners, many of them yeah. who are aid workers. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm thinking of maybe 10 or 15 situations over the last year. Uh, was that ever a risk for you at that time? Was kidnapping in style in those days? Well, I, I, I would argue one of the biggest changes in the 40 years I've been involved in, early on, in most cases, when you when you came in, people wanted you there, yeah. and they, they thought you were a really good person, and you're, gonna, you're helping them. Mm. But now, it, it, in just in the last decade, I would say, um, aid workers now are pawns like everybody else, yeah. whether it's groups that want to kidnap you, you know, and get money back for it, or whether they want to make a point that says, we don't want these people here and we'll, we'll, we'll attack them. Is there an American stigma attached to World Vision, uh, seen as the, you know, the big bad American coming in with his colonial ideas? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's less true now, yeah. just because we're very much an international organization. Right. I mean, just to give you an example, World Vision Korea, where we started, now, I, I don't know the exact numbers right now, but they, they now are raising two to $300 million a year to give to poor countries. Wow. That's, that's a country that was basically broken in 1950. Yeah. Now, it's taken a while, but that's, that's an example of, of change and what can happen. Now, what about Khmer, uh, uh, Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge? What, what, was, what was happening there? Well, you, you had a conflict. It was, to a certain extent, part of the Indochina War, and the, the bombing in Cambodia was a tro It was just incredible amount of bombing. Yeah. And as a result, uh, the government there fell, and there was this radical group um, led by Pol Pot mm -hmm. that the, their basic idea was, it's, it's so arrogant, they said, we're going to go back to base zero. We're going to, they, they, that's just part of their ideology. We will go and restart this country at zero. Hmm. And so they, they had a real uh, discrimination against anybody with an education. If you wore glasses, you were likely to be suspicious. People got shot and, and murdered because they had because that meant you had some education perhaps. Really? And they, were, they wanted everybody to go back to zero. And uh, the killing that went on there was they, they killed, there's debate about this, but anywhere from one and a half to two million people. And I think the population of the country was somewhere six to seven million people. So could have even been three million pack, people, actually. I when think you, it was 40% actually that were killed. You know, our time is up for this interview. I, I want to pick up on the next interview because I want to ask you why you were there and what you discovered when you got there. Friends, if you are familiar at all with World Vision, you know, as do I, that they are a uh, ministry to be respected. Uh, World Vision is so highly regarded. It has uh, huge credibility in our world. And uh, Dave Toyson, uh, you know, even though he's now retired, represents 43 years of that uh, impetus of this remarkable ministry in the world. And when you see uh, an appeal from World Vision, it's an appeal you can trust. You know, uh, they are an organization with integrity. You'll be joining me again for our next interview, next program, so you'll be watching that, and I'll take a break. I'll be back with our Bible study segment right after this.
Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. So we're finally in Mark, friends. I, I still am a little bit culture shocked because we've spent over the last two years in Matthew. <laughs> but I'm in no rush. I hope you're not. We started Mark. Who knows how long that'll take? And I've just released, in fact, today it came to me from the printer, Catalan's Casual Commentary. And this is the first half of Mark. Uh, it's 55 pages. It's designed to help you in our study, but to fill in some of the blanks that I cannot address because of time on television and you can get you can have a copy so just ask for it uh, through whatever means you want to ask whether it's the internet or telephone or mail or whatever all of those coordinates are up there on the screen from time to time and we'll be happy to send it to you and remember to support our ministry with your best gift no charge for this of course but we're establishing a relationship here and I really really rely on those who are faithfully supporting us month by month okay we're in Mark, Mark 1. We're starting now with verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Whoa. You know, uh, Mark just, uh, I've made this point a few times already, but Mark just, he's so blunt, you know, he just, he uses very little flowery language, not many adjectives, not many adverbs, he just sort of, you know, tells the story as it is. He pulls, uh, he pulls no punches. Uh, you know, this is a, a remarkable story that's happening here right now, and he covers it in just, uh, what, uh, three sentences, two sentences, whatever. But what's happening is that Jesus, Mark's, uh, uh, John's cousin, is coming down to be baptized. What? Why would Jesus be baptized? And Mark doesn't tell us why. Now, some of the other gospel writers do, but I'm just dealing with Mark here right now. I'm not going to refer to other gospel writers. Just, we're dealing with Mark here. So, you know, the why question will not be answered by Mark, all right? But there is, I think, uh, an implication of sorts in that it would be very affirming to John's ministry ultimately for people to know that Jesus was baptized by him, even though at the time, they, most of them wouldn't even know who Jesus was, all right? So very affirming of John, but also very affirming of Jesus. Not necessarily John's affirming him, but his heavenly Father affirming him. You are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. I mean, how affirming is that to hear that from God the Father? It's not theater. This is not something that's being done just to kind of provide a nice uh, little dramatic t touch to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Jesus is honoring John uh, as the last of the Old Testament, Old Covenant prophets. That's really what he's doing. Uh, it's a watershed, and, you know, it's... Ironic that the watershed is happening in the water, <laughs> in the river. But 
the era of the Old Testament is about to yield to the era of the New Testament. The old wine is about to yield to the new wine. The old wineskin is going to be set aside and the new wineskin is going to be utilized. It's all happening right here in the Jordan. So, John personified the prophetic call of the Old Testament prophets to righteousness and justice because that essentially was their message. A call to the people of God to be in right relationship with God, righteousness, right relationship with neighbor, justice. I, I write about that extensively. If any of you have read my book, uh, When God Stood Up, A Christian Response to AIDS in Africa, you, you, you know I have a whole chapter on that. Um, to me, it's a really, really critical message. But um, he also, in a very interesting way, John, was fulfilling the expectation of the return of Elijah to prepare the way for the kingdom of heaven. And this is something that goes right back to the prophet Micah. And it's not suggesting for a minute that the scripture is teaching reincarnation, but the spirit of Elijah, of you know that, that remarkable uh, man of God, is something that, if you will, is going to be almost placed on John as a kind of a mantle you know, of, uh, of anointing. So, John's being affirmed, no question about it. But Jesus is being affirmed. You are my beloved son. Um, a voice came from heaven. A voice. Okay? That's a very interesting word in, um, in the Hebrew. I, let me write it up here. Bat kol. Uh, that's the transliteration of the Hebrew. I, I could write it in Hebrew, but I'm not very good at it, and you wouldn't be able to read it anyway, so let's just write it in English letters, bat kol, which uh, basically means daughter or echo of the voice. This was a reference to any kind of holy vocalization that uh, some mighty men and women of God may have experienced over the course of centuries of God's dealing with Israel. Okay, the bat kol, the daughter, the echo of the voice. In some ways, what he's saying here is an echo of Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and also Isaiah chapter 42, 1. Uh, in, in Psalm 2, you've got a psalm of accession for a king, for Messiah. In Isaiah 42, you have a prophecy of service, a kind of a servant song. But what you have here, essentially in Old Testament terms, is a king and a servant. Jesus represents a king and a servant. He's going to reign, but he's also going to serve, which is pretty touching, huh? And as son, he is unique and, need I say it, supernatural. Now, that doesn't mean he's not son of man. He's definitely son of man. But he's also son of God. No question about that. Um. Uh, so we have a, a very, very interesting uh, thing happening here. Uh, Jesus, we don't know how long it had been since he'd seen his cousin John, but John certainly recognized him. And if he had suspected Jesus was Messiah, now as he sees him and now as he hears the voice, he knows that he's on track. Now, he's going to be disappointed. In fact, at one point, and we'll get to that, he's questioning Jesus. Are you the one that we thought you were, or are we looking for somebody else? And uh, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll leave that, but nevertheless. So, immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Okay, there's another one of those... Uh, personifications of the Holy Spirit. And then a voice from heaven, you're my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Okay? I, I, I reread the immediately because you got immediately and you got immediately. Right? Immediately coming up from the water, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. <laughs> immediately means immediately. It doesn't mean that suddenly Jesus just turned around and left, but I kind of think maybe it does mean that. I don't know. But it was certainly soon after the baptism 
Uh, Mark doesn't record any conversation that Jesus and, and John may have had. Away he goes. Now, in the wilderness, they're already in the wilderness. Where, where John was baptizing is right down, you know, at the, at the same level as the Dead Sea, about 1,450 uh, feet below sea level. It's the lowest spot on the earth. And believe me, and I've been there many, many, many times over the years, both when I lived there and then as I've been doing TV there, it is hot. It is arid. It is adversarial. It's a wonder anyone can live there for a day, let alone a week or a month or a year. John was doing it, and there were those down near uh, the Dead Sea in Qumran, the Essenes who were doing it. Jesus is about to just go to another part of the wilderness, same heat, same arid situation, and for 40 days, he's going to be fasting. We'll get to that in our next program. The Bible tells us that true religion is visiting orphans and widows in their distress. The Bible also says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Heaven's core values for mankind begin with God's heart for the least of these. When you support WOW, you're in the sweet spot of God's heart for the poor. Yes, we're only a small player in this great drama, but at least we're on the field. Please give generously. I got an email recently saying, so Jim, what is it you do with WOW, working for Orphans and Widows? Uh, JCT is the official voice of WOW. My wife and I founded WOW 20 years ago, as we founded JCT about four years ago. WOW, what you can do is you can check out wowmission.com. Well, that's the best thing. Just go to the website, wowmission.com, W-O-W mission.com, working for Orphans and Widows. Uh, we work with Orphans and Widows. Jesus' half-brother James said, pure religion undefiled, the kind of religion God endorses is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We have encountered thousands of orphans and widows in distress over the last 20 years in Sub-Saharan Africa and now in India as well, and also East Africa. Uh, it's overwhelming, but a huge work is being done. We work exclusively through local churches. Everything's being done in the name of the Lord. Check us out, wildmission.com. 